Now at 11 o'clock, an Oregon man says he was arrested for not wearing a mask. Plus, Black Lives Matter. The words now cover a Portland street, but there's an even bigger lesson hidden in the art. And later, restaurants get creative to keep customers separated during the pandemic. This is KGW News at 11. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I'm Dan Haggerty. We're going to start with several moves aimed at stopping the spread of COVID-19 and all are facing some backlash tonight. First, plans for an isolation center in the town of Woodburn. Those who have tested positive for the virus but don't need hospital care could go there to quarantine themselves. Mike Benner found out critics are very worried about the location. With the afternoon sun beating down on them, several dozen people stand outside the Super 8 in Woodburn. Way to go! Woo! They're not at all thrilled with the county's plans for the 81-room hotel. We have a huge senior community. This is not a good thing for us or anybody. As soon as next week, Marion County intends to turn the Super 8 into a COVID-19 isolation center. Anyone who may have been exposed to the virus or has a mild case of it and has nowhere to go can stay at the isolation center. For instance, farm workers or those under the supervision of parole and probation. The biggest concern I have is is the fact of where they're proposing to have this facility. And that deals with proximity to vulnerable populations here in Woodburn, which is a senior community. And I, if you've been to Woodburn, that area that they want to locate this in is literally senior estates. The whole area around that is senior estates. So their safety, not only from a you know, a COVID perspective, but for also for public safety. Eric Morris, who sits on the Woodburn City Council, is also frustrated with the process. He says the county snuck this through with little, if any, public input. It's a blind spot on my part that I didn't communicate this earlier because we've been going really fast on a lot of things. Marion County Commissioner Kevin Cameron acknowledges how fast things have moved, and he's sorry. He also understands the fears and concerns over the isolation center, but says there's nothing to worry about. What this facility is, is a place where people will be quarantined. They will be self-isolating for two weeks, 14 days. They won't come out of their rooms. Uh, they will be in their rooms. We will have security on premise. At the end of their 14 days, we will provide transportation to take them back exactly where they belong, whether that's in a mission or back to their farm where they're working. They won't be wandering the streets. They won't be, you know, free to just go wherever they want to. I have doubts that they are going to be able to um, do what they're promising to do. As you can see, there's a large number of people not buying what the county's selling. They're hoping the city can put a stop to it. It's very fair to say that our, our efforts in protecting our community here are at risk. According to the Woodburn City Administrator, operating an isolation center inside the Super 8 may be illegal due to current land use laws. The city council is pledging to go after the county. We'll, of course, follow this to see how it all plays out. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Now, today we learned that Oregon Governor Kate Brown will release 57 prisoners who are at high risk of uh, because of coronavirus. More than 200 inmates and staff within Oregon's prison system have tested positive and one inmate has died up to this point. Now, here's the criteria these inmates who will be released have met. They are medically vulnerable. They have served most of their sentence and they did not commit crimes against another person. State lawmakers have called on the governor to release far more people, submitting a plan that would qualify thousands for early release and make it easier for people to socially distant, stay socially distant inside prisons, the people who remain. The governor's office said she does not have any plans for any further action right now. Washington's mask requirement kicks in tomorrow. Now, unlike Oregon's, which just applies to seven counties, Washington's rule is statewide. It applies to indoor public spaces like stores and offices and restaurants, but they're also required outdoors when social distancing is not possible. Enforcement of the mask mandates have become pretty murky. Sheriffs have said that they don't really have the capacity to go around following up on complaints. Oregon's governor has said that she hopes enforcement isn't needed, and some individual jurisdictions have their own kinds of guidelines. But in the small town of Sweet Home, a man says his refusal to wear a mask landed him in jail. Catherine Cook has the story. Health officials continue emphasizing the need to wear masks to prevent the spread of COVID-19. In many places, they're required. That includes the Sweet Home Municipal Court in Lynn County. We're in an unprecedented time. 
Uh, we're all kind of learning as we go through this. That's Sweet Home City Manager Ray Towery. He's been fielding a lot of questions about what happened in court Wednesday. John J.T. Culbeth appeared on harassment and traffic citations, and he refused to wear a face mask. Culbeth shared his side on the Lars Larson radio show. When I checked in at the clerk's window, uh, the clerk promptly told me, well, you need to have a face mask on. And I was confused and said, well, um, I don't, and I'm not going to because... I, I have enough breathing issues as it is. She goes, well, uh, the, the judge is going to disagree with that. He did. Towery says Judge Larry Blake Jr. didn't back down on face mask requirements. He said, uh, you know, you need to wear a mask. Again, he refused. Um, the judge said, well, you don't really have a choice, essentially. And, and uh, Mr. Colbert said, well, then I'm just going to leave. And he left. Colbert says he tried to explain his health reasons for not wearing a mask. That I have enough you know, respiratory issues as it is, but I'm more than willing to come back another day. And uh, he, he didn't like that idea. Um, and so finally, I just said, fine, I'll just leave. Minutes later, the police chief arrested Colbeth in the parking lot and booked him into jail for failure to appear and contempt of court. He said, well, he issued a warrant. Towery says despite multiple advance notifications of face mask requirements, Colbeth never called ahead to ask for special health accommodations. He says the court would have gladly made them. But was two hours in jail necessary? I think he was acting within the scope of his authority and... and uh, like I said, As a municipal court judge, putting right. someone in jail for not wearing a mask is in the scope of his authority? So he didn't put him in jail for not wearing a mask. He put him in jail for failure to appear. He left and for contempt. He left right in the middle of the hearing, left during the interaction with the judge and, and walked out. So was not wearing the mask part of the issue that, that certainly elevated this to the situation that it's become? Absolutely. Judge Blake arraigned Colbeth in jail and set his next court date for July 22nd. Colbeth says the judge was clear. When you come back on July 22nd, if you're not wearing a face mask or you don't have a doctor's note saying you're not legally required to wear a face mask, you're going to go to jail. Catherine Cook, KGW News. It was like a tar riff there. I must have been on Lars's show. Hey, um, in Clark County, leaders are preparing to apply for phase three of reopening tomorrow. That means gyms could open to 50% capacity. You'll be able to go to the library as well. Restaurants could open at 75% capacity. Theaters uh, could be back open at 50% capacity. The health officer says the number of COVID-19 cases in the county is relatively low and testing, contact tracing, and medical resources are all where they need to be for approval. If approved, leaders think phase three could begin early next week. We have some new information tonight on a tragic accident at a Portland park today. A large tree branch fell on top of a van at Powell Park, killing one person inside. Another person was injured. Witnesses say it appeared that the two were living in that van. Fire officials say the branch came off of an old oak tree due to what's called sudden branch drop disorder. It happens when parts of the tree weaken over the winter, then break during the warmer months. Today marks one month since George Floyd was killed by police in Minneapolis. In that time, we've seen massive protests in Portland and cities across the country. The initial large protest turned into a riot here with significant damage downtown. Demonstrations in the day following brought thousands to march in the city, standing up for black lives and the end to police brutality. We've also seen statues of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington toppled in the city and the push for change continues today. Protesters gathered in Pioneer Courthouse Square. They were joined by the mother of Patrick Kimmons. He was shot and killed by Portland police in 2018 after investigators say he shot two people. I want justice for Protests also continue each night in front of the Justice Center downtown. That's where we've seen the confrontations between officers and demonstrators. A St. John's, uh, John's Street now bears a reminder of Portland's racist history. Devin Haskins shows us the art shining a light on a dark past. Under the shadow of the St. John's Bridge, a quiet neighborhood street has a message bright enough for everyone to see. From above, the words Black Lives Matter can be seen filling the entire street. It was interesting to see the, 
the beginning part of it. The beginning isn't just the letter B, but what's written on almost every letter throughout. And after seeing it on Facebook, Tiffany and her mom, Sherry, came to see it in person. There are a lot of other things written on the yellow that I knew nothing about. So it was really an education for me as well as pride that somebody took the time to write it down. Because we need to know where we've come from so we don't repeat it. It is a brief glimpse looking at Portland's history of racism from 1800 till now. We are all a part of history. You can find your birth date somewhere between these letters and see that the story continues. The story of art was conceived by Nick Lloyd. He was inspired by what he saw in Washington, D.C. and during the protests. He first started painting last Thursday night, but soon found he wasn't alone. One woman and her like eight-year-old daughter stopped for an hour to paint. This was very much a, a neighborhood doing it more than a person. The story of our city began many years ago, and like the blank canvas of the final letters, is still being told. It started before us, it will continue after us, and we only can control the portion that's in front of us. It's a lot of history. In St. John's, Devin Haskins. It's powerful. KGW News.